We're going to begin a new uh, series today called Trust in the Lord. What it means to trust God. <clears throat> I began feeling uh, led at the beginning in the spring, actually, to, uh, that we would be headed in this direction at this time. At the beginning of the year, I don't know if you remember, but uh, at the very beginning of 22, we did a sermon series on what it means to believe. And we talked about that because a lot of people say they believe, but do they really believe? Well, the Lord, uh, I, I've actually uh, uh, been a kind of a student of what it means to trust God since um, the late 80s, to be honest with you. And God has uh, done a, a great work in my life, and I will tell you that uh, I haven't fully comprehended this. As a matter of fact, I've learned uh, fresh and anew, a fresh encounter with the Lord this year, what it truly means to um, rely upon, rest in, wait upon, and just dwell with God and just have full peace and comfort from what it means to trust in the Lord. And this is a promise of God. This is something that God says that we need to have, we should have. Psalms 37 was written by David, and today I'm just going to kind of do a little bit of a an introduction into the series, and I pray that God will add His blessings to it. It says in verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land, feed on His faithfulness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now Lord, this is Your place. These are Your people. This is Your Word. And you have lived it in the life of your people and your prophets. And we've heard these words, O oh Lord. And there are times that we uh, uh, were able to uh, get beyond the wisdom of this world and, and see you. And see your glory. See your blessings. See all the things that you have in store for us. But Lord, there's also those other times where We've relied upon our own self and our own thinking and our own wants and wishes and our own uh, ways. And Lord, we've pushed through. And Lord, it's been dry desert seasons like the children of Israel just wasting away because they couldn't trust You. And Lord, I, I pray that in my life, I pray that in the life of these people, that today, Lord, we could have a fresh encounter with You. That You could awaken us to Your promises once again. And Lord, uh, all is vain if You don't speak. So I pray that in the next few moments, the power of God will be upon every heart that is here for Your purpose, for Your will. In Jesus' precious name and only name, I pray and live. Amen. You know, I know of a pastor who uh, grew up in the Bible Belt. He was actually the son of a preacher as well as I am. And uh, I guess it's kind of a unique thing to be the son of a preacher. They call it living in the fishbowl. You're always under public scrutiny. Everybody's there, you know, like the fish is in the glass and everybody's looking at them. And it's really not a, a great feeling to have, to be honest with you. A lot of preacher's kids, uh, my, not all, but some may go in wrong directions because of having to grow up inside the fishbowl. I, I've been thinking about it this week. I've probably lived 54 of my 60 years in the fishbowl. And it's um, unique to be under public scrutiny. Now, I, I want to say that that is a good thing. We may not like how it feels when you're in the fishbowl, but it is a good thing because what the preacher preaches that people want to know that he is living what he's preaching. And they want to know that when he goes through things, is the Word of God that he's preaching real? And that's a good thing, and it's important. But kids kind of get put into that too, and everybody says, well, why don't you be like the preacher's kids? You know, and the preacher's kids are usually mean. Except for you, Jerry, you're not mean. <clears throat> I always tell everybody the preacher's kids are mean because they play with the deacon's kids. <laughs> but this person that I knew, he grew up in a, in, a, in a home. His father was a very successful Baptist pastor and 
preached uh, uh, really all over the United States in revivals and conferences and conventions. And, and he grew up in it, and kind of like me, he, he kind of got kidnapped and thrust in the ministry. He had other plans, but God used in an amazing way. And, and he said that he decided that he was going to go to a place probably where there was not a church on every corner and maybe the, the fishbowl wouldn't be quite so small. So he went out west and he planted a church out west. And he went out there and did it like he, he, all he had ever known. He had uh, seen uh, preaching and li Christian living modeled by his father and, and other key people in his life. And he began to preach like that and to tell the stories of Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham and Joseph and Moses and David and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Jesus and Matthew and Peter and Paul. And what he found was that the people out there, they didn't grow up in the Bible Belt. They didn't know those stories. Some of them may have heard of Jesus, but they didn't know what all those other things meant. He found when he was preaching and he would reference things that nobody had any clue what he was talking about. And he began to preach in such a way that every sermon that he preached was basically the very fundamentals as if someone had never heard the Word of God before. And that was a blessing for him. And I think in my own life, I've learned from that too. Laura Wilson said to me, I guess a couple months ago, she said, you preach differently on Sunday mornings than you do on Wednesday nights. And I said, that's correct. On Wednesday nights, I know the ones that come there on Wednesday night come with a great hunger for God. And they, uh, I dare say, all of them know the Lord. And they want to grow closer with the Lord. And I, I can do more teaching, preaching in that circumstance. But on Sunday, when I'm preaching and I never know who's watching, who's in the building, who's a guest, who, where they are in their spiritual life, I probably pro myself to preaching more of just taking things at the very fundamental basics, not taking anything for granted, not assuming that you know things, and letting it come, if it does come to you, with a freshness that would come with the anointing of the Holy Spirit directed upon your heart, hearing what it, the application that He has to your life, because He is the preacher. And when I think about this, and I think about these words, trust in the Lord, a lot of us who have heard a lot of preaching and teaching, we hear that word, and that word trust is very, uh, it's, it, it's very common to us. As a matter of fact, when I say that word trust, you probably have some certain thoughts that come to you. When I say, what does it mean to believe? What does it mean to love? What does it mean to have faith or trust? Or what does it mean to follow God? You may have some concepts that come to your mind. But it may not be the concept that the Lord would like to share with you. Matter of fact, some of these thoughts have been modeled to us in our life. Either well or not so well. You may have seen someone who was a great believer or who had great faith and you looked at that and you learned from it. But you may have seen someone that you looked up to and they may not have been modeling it well. They may have had some kind of a mixture of the truths of God and the wisdom of the world and, and maybe you looked at that as the path to follow and it led you in a way that did not help. God wants us to know fresh what it means to follow Him. We need to learn these principles of truth. To say that we believe is highly important. James 1.22 said, Be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only. Sometimes we think of a word like believe and we say, I, I, yes, of course I believe. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe that He he'll, left heaven. He went to the cross and, and He died and, and, and rose again and is in heaven. I, I believe those things. But sometimes we want to define them with words and Jesus wants us to define it with actions. Be ye doers of the Word 
and not hearers only. Most of the time when we quote that, we leave it there, but the next two words are important. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. If you think that you're believing and you're not living it, you may not be living it well. This is the reason that when Jesus preached, a lot of times he told stories, parables, because you could see in the, in the story the application of it. And it wasn't just learning a truth. It was about living a truth. Love. I doubt that there's anybody that doesn't have some kind of a definition of love. Lynn and I heard a definition a, a couple, couple weeks ago that I thought was very good. They said lust is what when you won't to receive something, or lust is about what you get. Love is about what you give. That's good. The word love in the Bible means to cherish. It means to put it above you. That everything in your life is to be given towards that. As a matter of fact, you serve it, and, and you would give anything and else for it. You cherish it more than anything else. I don't know that I've seen that model too much in my life. Some. Most people just love when it makes them happy. And if it doesn't make them happy, they'll just walk away. Someone will say something to them and they'll just say, I I I'll never speak to that person again. I'll never look at that person the same way again. I'll never love that person. That person has to prove it to me again. That's not biblical love. Trust is the same way. I love going to groups and when I share somebody, I'll say, uh, what does it mean to trust? And they'll say words, one or two words, and they'll say maybe something very profound like, well, it means to rely upon. And that is what the word trust means, but it means much more than that. So I'll, I'll look at them and say, well, what else? Tell me, tell me more. And they'll say something else, and I'll say, well, that's good. What else? And I'm trying to pull more of them out, more out of them. And I think that's what Jesus would say. Because you see, I'm not sure that we truly understand what it means to trust. Or we'll trust as far as we want to trust. I could take a chair and pull it up here, and you could look at it, and you, I'd say, do you trust this chair? You know what I mean. You look at it and you say, well, I've sat in chairs before. It looks fairly sturdy. I guess I could do that. I think it can hold my weight. That'd be good. You go out and you get in your car and you, you believe that when you push the gas pedal, it'll go. And you believe that when you push the brake, it'll stop. Amen. If you turn it to the steering wheel to the right, it'll go to the right. If you turn it to the left, it'll go to the left. And if you're going down the road and you see a bridge over troubled waters over there, you believe that that car will take you and that bridge will hold you and you'll be safe as you travel to the other side. But how many of you have ever been to that place where you looked and the bridge was big? And it went up real high, and you could look, and it was kind of hard to see the shore on the other sides. And when you got up there and you looked down at those waters, and maybe the butterflies begin to fly in your stomach just a little bit. I believe I was about 10 years old when we went to the Chesapeake Bay. Anybody know where the Chesapeake Bay is there? And, and they, had a, 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 they didn't have a bridge, they had a tunnel. And I wasn't too fired up about that. I said, we're going underneath that thing. And that's exactly what we did. We went down underneath all those waters. And you know what was going through my mind? If that thing sprung a leak at this time, there's water going to go in here and it's going to fill up and I don't know if I can make it. And those butterflies may start swarming in your stomach. Anybody ever felt that way just a little bit? Now, some of you, I, I've flown in a plane a lot of times, and I remember the first time I was a teenager and I got in that thing, and I said, this thing's big, and it's heavy. And I looked out there, and there was a motor on that side, and there was an engine on that side, and I thought, and that thing's going to push us through the air? And I really didn't care that everybody said, this is the safest way to travel I had seen that movie Airplane, and I had seen a few others, and they crash and they burn, and I wasn't too sure about that because I saw all that luggage and all these people, and 
I, I wasn't too sure about all that. But sure enough, we got up in the air and flew hundreds of miles and hours and tens of tens of thousands of feet up there. And what would happen if that pilot had a heart attack? I mean, it's not like it is in Hollywood, you know, where someone comes from the back and said, I spent the night at a Holiday Inn Express last night and I think I can land this plane. I, I don't think that's how it works. If they came back to me, I guarantee you that's not how it would work. It'd be like when Lynn swats one of those wasps with, a, with her fly flap, you know, and it comes flying through the air doing like that. That's exactly what that plane would do when it crashed and burned. And yet... We say that we trust in those airplanes. Matter of fact, I've flown a lot now. Matter of fact, you get up in that plane and you're tens of thousands of feet up there and then you find this thing called turbulence. And you know the first time flyers, because oh, they're over there going, <laughs> amen? But the ones that have flown and flown and flown, they just got their Diet Coke in their hand and they're sipping on it and they're talking so casually. I mean, they're going around like this and they're just acting no big deal whatsoever because they've been there before. Listen to me. There's a lot of good-hearted, well-meaning Christians who are living things in their life that they've never experienced. And they don't know what it means. And they pray that they never have to learn. Psalms 37 was written by a man by the name of David. And he had learned what it means. If you have your Bible, in verse number 25, it says this. I have been young, and now I'm old. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> anybody feel that way today i have been young there was a day that i was young but i feel kind of old today somebody asked me how i felt this morning i said i don't bounce as good as i used to i feel some of the airs flattened out in me and i kind of thud when i bounce you know but David was looking back on this at the end of his life and after all of those experiences and he was reflecting back and as he was reflecting back, he was saying these words, God is good. No matter the circumstances, my God is able. I may have failed God, but God has never failed me. I've been through the valley of the shadow of death. You ever been there? You ever walked that path? And yet the God of eternity is the God of comfort that finds you there. He restores your soul. He calms your fears and speaks peace into your life. I once was young, but now I'm old. I know of no other Scripture in the Word of God that so wonderfully well depicts all the attributes and things that come together that define what it means to trust in the Lord. We're going to take weeks. And we're going to look at all of them one at a time. We're going to look at all the factors and how David learned what it meant to trust the Lord. I was introduced to this, like I said, in the, the late 80s. I was at a pastor's conference, and one of my favorite preachers, Ron Dunn, was preaching. And he began to preach on this, and it blessed my soul. I loved Ron Dunn. He uh, pastored a church in Irving, Texas, named Matt MacArthur Boulevard, I just loved everything about him. He was funny. He was profound. He was brilliant. And I always just assumed this man had such a special anointing. You know, you've heard those preachers, and when they preach, you just say, they got the it factor. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I, I'm not sure what the it is, but they just got the it factor. As a matter of fact, another one of my favorite preachers, Adrian Rogers, used to say about Ron Dunn, he said Ron was one of his favorite preachers too, and he made this statement. He said, every time I hear Ron preach, I learn something. I think, wow. 
if Adrian Rogers learns something, the man who has the voice of God, I mean, man, what a profound preacher. And I, 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 I loved Ron and before I ever got to know him. Back in the day, we used to have tape clubs, and, and, and I was on Ron's tape club, and he would send me a cassette tape of one of his sermons every month. I paid $5, and I was very happy to do that. And I began to buy all of his books. And then I heard him preach a sermon. kind of shared a little bit more of his story he had three children two boys and a girl one of his sons was named after him ron dunn jr they called him ronnie and some of you will know what i mean when i say that ron ronnie was bipolar that's a chemical imbalance that you have in your brain and when the everything is great when things are going great the highs could never be so highs, but when the things get out of balance, they will go manic and the lows will never be so low. And it's like living with someone who's on a roller coaster and you never know what day how their life would be. One day everything would be great and everything would be wonderful, everything is gold, and the next day it's doom and damnation and despair. And could you imagine what it would be like the war zone of that home where this man who always was the most positive preacher and Bible student and encourager and, and lover of souls had a son that was going through the very the portals of, 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 of turmoil in his life and living with a tornado and up and down and up and down. And they do have medication that will help and balance out the chemical imbalance in the brain. But the problem is, is that when you feel good, you don't think that you need the medicines, and you quit taking them, and that's what happened to Ron Jr. And one day, when he was manic, he went out and committed suicide. I could never understand what that could be like. Rick Warren, the pastor of the largest church, Southern Baptist Church in the United States, who's trained more preachers in his church than all six of our seminaries together, had a son with the same mental issue. He calls it a mental disability, and his son committed suicide as well. I could never imagine Pray that I never find out. Amen. But Ron watched his son die and he buried his son, but he was at that time an itinerant preacher or a revivalist evangelist and a large church had booked him the next week. He didn't want to let the church down. They had spent much time and money and so he went and he preached. And I heard one of the sermons that week on tape. I wasn't there in person. And I heard him begin to share of God is able. That with God there are no dead ends. There may be detours in our plans, but nothing has ever missed the plans of God. And we say all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are the called according to His purpose. And we stand on those principles of Romans 8.28. Yet we don't always understand all the things that people go through to live out those truths in their lives. To learn fully and completely what it means to trust in the Lord. To make matters worse in the years that were ahead after that, Ron began to go through some own diseases and disabilities in his own life, some hardships and pains, and he was, well, it's hard to see someone wilt away in front of you, but that's literally what happened. 
But it never slowed him down, and he preached on six continents during that time. In pain and heartache, in hospitals, out of hospitals, by the way, it ended up costing him his life prematurely. <clears throat> I don't dare say that I've learned these principles on my own. Ron wrote a book called Don't Just Stand There, Pray Something. That was a blessing. He wrote this one called Faith Crisis. And he wrote this one called <clears throat> When Heaven is Silent. And in the foreword to this, he, he said, I'm writing this out of self-defense. He said, I'm writing this not simply for the blessing of others, but so that he would know it. I want you to know and hear that some of the things that have happened in your life, the history of bondage, the history of failure and pain, of words that have been spoken, of broken relationships, of things that you've walked through have been chapters in the book of God uniquely written for you to where you could be the full and complete child of God with a fresh love relationship with a holy God who cares more about you than all of the universe that there's nothing that goes through your mind, nothing that goes through your heart that God doesn't care more about than you do. Ron wrote what he called the three laws of trusting God. I want to make sure that you don't think that uh, these are my laws. I, I, I give him full footnote and credit to it. I, I guess I have to add my own meat to the bone because I could never preach in the great way that he could. But I want to share with you today, as we begin this series on what it means to trust God, to trust in the Lord, I want you to, to learn from what he learned, what it means to trust in the Lord. Law number one. Are you ready? The only way that you can learn to trust God is by trusting God. You're not going to learn to trust God by hearing me preach about it. You're not going to learn to trust God by reading a book that talks about the, what God did in someone else's life. You're not going to learn to trust God by, by, by going to a conference or uh, going to the library or Googling it. You're not going to learn to trust God by finding a friend and going and sharing your circumstances or finding a counselor. I'm saying any of those things may be good. Any of those things may help. But please understand this when I say it. The only way you can learn to trust God is by doing it. By trusting God. You don't learn to swim by watching someone else do it. You don't learn to swim by reading a book. You don't learn to swim by watching the Olympics on TV and saying, I think I can do the butterfly better than him. Sooner or later, you're going to get to that place where you've never been before, and though others tell you it is dangerous, you're going to have to launch out for yourself. You don't learn to fly a plane by watching a movie about it. You're going to have to learn with a teacher. You're going to have to learn by actually getting in the cockpit and having a co-pilot there to watch you and talk you through it and help you out. You don't learn surgery by watching some TV show. You have to be there and do it. And by the way, I'm grateful that they practice before they try it on me. Amen? Praise God and hallelujah. 
The only way that you can learn to do it is by doing it. Jesus took 70 of his disciples out, anointed them, listen to me now, gave them the power of the Holy Spirit. I say that because he didn't give them something that you don't have. They didn't have access to something that, that we don't have access to. He gave them the same Holy Spirit that He gave us, but He sent them out to do ministry. And with the power of God, they spoke and people heard and lives were changed. They healed the sick. They cast out demons. Why did Jesus do that? Because they had heard a lot of preaching about it but they needed to practice it in their life. The only way you can learn to trust God is by trusting God. Many Christians are, 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 are speaking of things that they've never experienced it, and the truth is they hope they never experience it. Law number two. The first law is the only way to learn to trust God is by trusting God. The second law is this. You won't trust God until you have to. I wish I knew why. I wish I could tell you today that you could hear this sermon and the Holy Spirit would speak and you could walk out of here and you could say, yes, I am going to trust God. No, you're not. At least not yet. Not yet. Because as long as we can take care of it, you know what we're going to do? We'll take care of it. As long as we can handle it, we'll handle it. I mean, I like my opinion just as good as you like yours. Now, you may value your opinion more than you value my opinion, and that's your prerogative. But I kind of like mine. And as long as we have a an inkling and an idea? You ever lost something and tried to find it? You tried and you tried and you tried. And you couldn't find it and you didn't want to ask anybody else where it might could be? Come on. Men, you ever been lost and didn't want to stop for directions? That was an amen, amen moment, ladies, and you blew it. As long as we've got another ace up our sleeve... We're not going to trust God. Matter of fact, as long as we can pay the bills, as long as we have a reasonable amount of health, as long as the dog's not biting us and we're not going to get fired at work, as long as that wasp is and chasing us around the house when you're allergic, as long as the baby's not crying, you're pretty good. Listen to me. That's our aim in life is to get it so good that we don't have to trust God. And if things go awry, we might blame somebody else. It's their fault. We'll blame the government. Well, we blame them about everything else. But I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter how many times you Google it. It doesn't matter how many times you read books or ask advice. You're not going to trust God until you have to. Why is it He's our last resort? We've done everything else. I guess we need to pray. For David, he had learned what it means to trust God. But let me ask you a question. He was out there shepherding the sheep and the lion and the bear came how many of you would have blamed david if he had ran from that lion or bear how many of you would have ran from that lion or bear i was on instagram this week bored stiff and i saw a thing came up there and it, it was a guy that crawled up on the top of his semi truck to get away from a bear and i thought i would have too I mean, in church, y'all might have said, no, I would have stood up to him and said, sit. No, you wouldn't. Have. No, you wouldn't. Have. How many of you would have volunteered to fight Goliath? No other soldier did. I mean, the king. 
head and shoulders taller than everybody else. It was his responsibility to lead, but he didn't lead like that. And nobody was blaming anybody because no one, no one wanted to fight that ugly old guy. The truth of the matter is, we won't trust God until we have to. And yet, when everything stood against David, David knew that he could rely on the loving care of the Almighty. The first law is this. The only way you can learn to trust God is by trusting God. The second law is, is you won't trust God until you have to. The third law is, God sees to it that you have to. He'll knock every crutch out from under you that you're leaning on. That chair that you rely on will fall in the floor. That car that you think you can take care, that will take care of you, will lead you to places that you did not want to be. I was 17 years old. It was September 7th, 1979, a Friday night. I was entering the senior year of high school. I had everything that the world could offer. My world was good. And then we get a phone call that changed it all. It didn't affect me, but it affected my brother. He was in a car wreck. In the hours later, three surgeons were working on him at the same time. They pumped twice as much blood as the body could hold into him because he was bleeding out so quickly. He was in a coma for over two weeks. And at 17, I was the pallbearer for my sister-in-law who died in that car crash. I had never faced death before. And I remember walking through the parking lot at Erlanger Hospital in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and singing the song in my spirit, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Have you ever had any of those walks? You ever been punched in the gut? You ever seen all the things of life just slip away? All the things that you trusted in it, bankrupt, hated, fired, misunderstood, the doctor says that one word that you prayed you would never hear. But yet we understand with God that failures turn into successes. Frustrations lead us into godly patience and standing. Hardships lead us to love and peace that goes beyond anything that we could have ever comprehended before. God led Noah to a boat to face something that he had never experienced, rain, and God brought him through. God led Abraham. The will of God led Abraham to take his son, his only son, Isaac, up on the mountain and offering him, kill his son there on the altar. Moses who had been a failure and had been forgotten for 40 years on the backside of the desert, was there standing before Pharaoh, knowing that his life would be taken in front of him unless the power of God fell. Daniel, that we love to speak about, in a pagan land, no one would have said, it's okay. He bowed before God and not before the pagan leader with a death sentence hanging over him. And it didn't keep him from being on his knees. Jesus, on the cross of Calvary, the eternal God who had never faced being separated from the Father ever before, who had never separated death, who had never faced death before, 
who never had the Spirit leave him, yet went because of the value of the cross for you and I, willingly gave his life and allowed it to remain in that tomb for three days. Trusting that the Spirit would speak life into him again. And by the way, he did. And is alive forevermore. If God would allow those people to go down those paths because he loved them, why do you think he's going to spare you? If trusting God is this valuable, maybe we need to listen. Maybe we need to let our history not be a dead end, but understand that our history leads to our destiny. The only thing standing in the way is us. Church, I don't know what God's going to do in the today and in the days and the weeks that are ahead. But I tell you one thing I do know. I'm relying on Him to get us there. And if He's able to get my soul from where I am to heaven, I have a strange feeling that no matter what He places before us, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. He'll lead us wonderfully, beautifully, gloriously all the way home. Listen to the Spirit of God. Let Him speak.